you're on. It's yeah. about a 35 minute piece where I dance with the video, so to speak. And this is something I've been doing since 1998 at for the ASC or at a American Society for Cybernetic Meetings, starting with a piece I did in that Pile was there. I don't think anybody else here was there then on Gertrude Stein, the cybernetics of Gertrude right. Stein. And and I consider Gertrude Stein to be the grandmother of cyber, second order cybernetics. Margaret Mead was the mother, Mary Catherine, the daughter, and Gertrude Stein was is in my book, the grandmother of second cybernetics. So here we go. How might I explain the experience of being with bees cybernetically? This is my story about a book I wrote about honeybees called The Bees Needs. I've been being since 2014. This is the arboretum in the apiary where the bees live, where I stored bees that live there. This is the arboretum and some of the bees. Many people have oriented my thinking and doing as illustrated in this video, including people I met through the American Society for Cybernetics and the deep conversations we have had over the years. I just picked up two new nukes. A nuke is the nucleus of a hive. So it has a queen, some brood, some worker bees, and maybe a drone or two if we're lucky. And so I'm going to put those nukes now in their new hive boxes. The nucleus of a colony is similar to the nucleus of a society. It is a triadic relationship in which you need all three in order to have all three. In the 1998 Cybernetic and Human Knowing Journal, Rodney Donaldson writes, our perceptions about how things are, are grounded in our habits for languaging that are problematic outmoded, and at times downright lethal. Quote, we have a habit of seeing problems, attempting to fix them, and then find out in the long run our solutions make things worse, even wicked. We seem unaware that we each are and have an epistemology. What is an epistemology? Human knowing, as well as knowing that is characteristic of all living systems. One's stories are a reflection of one's epistemology. And as Gregory Bateson once said, you cannot not have an epistemology, only a bad one. So what is it to be a human nested in a cybernetic ontology, wanting to understand the characteristics and behavior of honeybees? You know, the problem of cybernetics is it is not an academic discipline that belongs in a department. Mm -hmm. It is an attempt to correct an erroneous way of looking at the world and at knowledge in general. What we would like is to affect what people think is common sense things that they take for granted, that in fact are problematic, about causality, about purposes, about relationships. To be a participant observer is actually problematic in American society. Mm -hmm. In 2011, upon receiving the Norbert Wiener ASC Award, Mary Catherine Bateson spoke of her father's paper from Beside of Cybernetics, in which he claims a need for new forms of communication that embrace the importance Deep listening is a way of, of listening being. differently. Deep listening is a way of being. He thought cybernetic thinking might be useful in doing so. Mary Catherine's hope was that those of us involved in the ASC, the American Society for Cybernetics, would embrace cybernetic ideas when engaging with society, speaking out in efforts to generate the changes so urgently needed 
and let's transform cybernetic understandings into a new common sense, a new way of being. I guess what I feel about the future of cybernetics is that the ethical implications of cybernetics are so profound that we need to continue to do all that we can to influence people's thinking to be more systemic. The obvious example in that case is climate change. January 2nd, 2022, and there are honeybees on this bush. See it? What the you heck is that? 60 some degrees. They're all finding Baltimore, a source of pollen and nectar here. That's insane. insane. This hive came down in a torrential thunderstorm and destroyed the whole colony. These types of storms are more and more common in Baltimore, Maryland, where I live. As we look at the, the pattern of our relationships and we discuss them, that discussion is in itself part of our description. And so I wanted to bring in a quote. The problem of trying to transmit our ecological reasoning to those whom we wish to influence in what seems to us to be an ecologically good direction is in itself an ecological problem. We are not outside the ecology for which we plan. We are always and inevitably a part of it. This, in effect, means that we live in cybernetics. We don't just stand outside and admire it and describe it, that we have to act with it. So actually, I think kindergarten is a little late to start learning cybernetics. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi. All right, so here we are at the Arboretum. It is June 1st. June 1st. June 1st. Wow. One of our last days of our internship. When did you start? April. Really? Twenty-six. Yes. And when did we start working the bees? April twenty-seventh. And we are here with Park School, Harris and Abby, doing their internship here, and they had their first experience going into not a hive but hives. Abby's got our records. And. Parish spotted a queen in Rosemary's Hive. <laughs> but we, we worked yeah, very early on. Wow. That's amazing. About six weeks, five weeks. And here we are from one to eight hives. One to eight. And you watched wow. it all happen and made it all happen. From a swarm to a hive. From a swarm to a hive. Beginning with a swarm. Ending with eight hives. <laughs> so today we went in and we looked at all the bees and what was your biggest surprise today well we had a queen excluder on a lot of hives and but we were still ending up with brood on the top hives which is really confusing because that's the opposite of what a queen excluder is supposed to do <laughs> yeah. and it happened multiple times so it's a mystery that we'll have to work on solving something made you both full-fledged beekeepers <laughs> oh, today yes. We both got stung today. For the first time. Yeah, both yep. on our heads. I only once, Paris. Four times. Four times. All at once, we might say. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't once. like she came back and got stung, came back, but, but <laughs> no. one time, four bees got up inside yeah. and did their duty. But so now we have full-fledged beekeepers. Yes. Two more to add to the crowd. And well, something else we did was that in hive four, since there's not much going on, so we took a frame of brood from hive three and a queen cell that we found and we put it in. So hopefully that gets them going. And it gives them time to, yeah. for that queen to start laying so that the worker bees don't start and lay them because they can't lay fertilized 
eggs. They lay eggs, but they're not fertilized, which means they're drones, and then you get drone bound, and then you forget that hive. So we might have just saved the hive today. So on your reflection of this month, anything you want to say about your experience of working at the Arboretum? I mean, I didn't come in knowing how much I would learn about beekeeping, but it's been sort of our primary project, and I just had no idea how formulaic, but also like flexible you had to be, and I mean, I just, I feel that I really have a handle on how beekeeping works, which is a huge deal that I wasn't, I mean, a skill that I'll keep for a long time. And you so weren't expecting it. I wasn't yeah. expecting it, but That's I, the I'm best more than part. excited That's about what it. always happens with bees, right? You go in with a plan and it never works out. It always changes. But it's important to have a plan knowing that it'll never work. Yeah. I also have learned so much more than I thought. All And it, it was all very experienced. It's all very, what's the word, experiential learning? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's it. I think it's the best kind of learning because we'd just be um, in the hives and then she would say, here, pass me an inner cover or <laughs> look at what's on this frame. What do you see? And we'd have to just like say what we saw. It's really made me realize how just complex and smart even these like tiny creatures are. Like bees are so smart and such hard workers. Um, and they have a whole like life. Like there's, I feel like there's a whole city going on over there. It's very exciting stuff. That's kind of what I'm just thinking right now. If we talked earlier about how this space at one point was an apartment, so so it's back to a residential place <laughs> of living, and it just really happens is. to be bees this time around. High rises and everything. Yeah. <laughs> thing. All right. Any final words for today? Thank you, Jude. Oh, my Thank pleasure. You, Thank you. It's been a real joy. I hope to continue the legacy of you guys by bringing in students next summer. We're gonna send them your way. Okay. Yeah. Hard and workers. They'll take them. Yeah. If they're hard workers, I'll take them. Choose plenty, okay. don't you think? Yeah, It'd no, be hard was... to do more than that with the, uh, yeah. with the hide. I agree. Okay. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. See you. Bye. 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 So. What's holding back the process of letting these ideas become part of our culture? Never underestimate the inertia of language. It is never trivial. There are things, there are errors that we live with in our, what we regard as common sense. Cybernetics, an attempt to correct our erroneous ways of looking at the world. There is a tradition in the American society for cybernetics for some of its members to address some of the illusions that underlie our hegemonic society. That objectivity is not only possible, but desirable. That aggression is our fundamental emotion that peace is something to be achieved so how how do we do social transformations well one possible technique for doing so is embracing alternatives when playing with language playing languaging avoidance for example, avoidance, a familiar term in cybernetic lexicons. I remember listening to Herbert Brune talk of avoidance at my first ASC conference in 1992, and since then, I've heard many others talk of it. In his 2012 paper entitled Idea Avoidance, Reflections on a Conference and Its Language, Larry Richards writes about the importance of generating a cybernetic languaging through a process of practicing and avoidance of certain ideas. Ideas so embedded in our everyday languaging spaces that it might be useful to consider suspending or avoiding them some of the time so that alternatives might emerge. Three ideas Richards mentions in his manifesto are hierarchy, purpose, and belief. Then, there's Susan Parente at the ASE meeting in 2012. The award you're giving me, the Warren McCulloch Award, could be considered an award for lifelong achievement. Achievement. The award I'm receiving, however, is the award for lifelong 
avoidance. <laughs> avoidance. Avoidance doesn't mean to just not do something. Avoidance happens when you do not something. When you do, but not something. I think of avoidance as something I do that I'm proud of. So I am suggesting we could shift the paradigm temporarily from achievement to avoidance. Woo. Avoidance becomes the landmark, not to forego achievement, but to dethrone it temporarily. What would it mean to think about a public intellectual? In a kind of design sense, or in the sense in which there is lived and perform and produce in the world. And then we were thinking about how a lot of the systems that we have, including social networks, are supposedly cybernetical, but at the very same time, they're also very linear. They're also not very dynamic, and they also tend to kind of like just perpetuate hierarchies, but it does not allow true feedback. Feed forward. I is a public intellectual when I does not do something in an effort to act publicly so that cybernetic ideas might make a difference. Performance. Cybernetics is about the reconfiguration of constraints in order to make possible what appeared to be impossible when avoiding what was previously considered inevitable. In his 2012 paper about avoidance, Richard suggests a public intellectual relies heavily on the arts as the agent for change rather than science. Since science is about change in a system and art is about change of a system. Richards goes on to suggest the arts offer a way to break the hegemony and perhaps generate a new order of things. Maybe even one that combines art and science. In my book, The Bee's Needs, is an artifact in an attempt to embrace cybernetic concepts and ideas, combining art and science, when exploring honeybee behavior while avoiding certain language in the process. And the book is geared towards people from 7 to 97, by the way. My premise, I have come to think not believe that if you change the language, you can change the thinking. If you change the thinking, you can change the doing. If you change the doing, you can change the culture. If you change the culture, you can change the languaging. Avoidance, one methodology for designing social transformations when designing social transformation. So let's talk honeybees. A common view of honeybees is a reductionist view, whereas the book, The Bees Needs, is a systemic cybernetic view about honeybee behavior and their environments and us. The unit of survival is the organism in its environment. I worked on this book for about six months with an illustrator who goes by the name book. Yes, I did a book with book. We met regularly and it was truly a collaboration between the two of us, a trans generational experience, similar to my one with Mary Catherine Bateson. People like to talk about honeybees and I like telling stories about bees. Stories nested in cybernetic ideas that go against the status quo. This book was an effort to do just that when avoiding certain language about honeybees and their behavior so that alternative language might emerge. And languaging. So let's explore some of the language we avoided and the alternatives that emerged when doing so through our deep conversations together deep in that they often included asynchronicities 
that we were able to synchronize without violence. I would do it again and again. And I think I know she would too. Faye, I should say. By the way, one role of the public intellectual when peace is a need rather than something to be achieved is to create conditions in which deep conversations can flourish. This requires a desire to live in love, generosity, reflection, and observing one's observing. Another story. So let's explore some of the language we've avoided in this book and alternatives that emerge. For example, I am a bee steward, not a beekeeper. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Harmony. Please welcome our guest, worker Honeybee. What an honor to have you with us today. Buzz, buzz, buzz. And this is our translator, Bee Steward. Worker Honeybee said, hi, thank you for having us. Bee Steward is a human who cares for honeybees living in a human made hive. So this is an introduction and I'm not the only one. Most of the language you'll and, and ideas in this book you will find in other books related to bees. By the way, people have been being forever. Another one, cooperation. What's it like to live in a hive? We are one group. We work together in cooperation. It's the only way we know how to be. A colony of honeybees is often referred to as a super organism that generates what's called a caste system, which is nested in a hierarchical view. So instead, in the book, we talk about types of bees that cooperate together that are not reflective of a caste system. There are three types of cate or categories of, of honeybees that make up a colony or a hive, what is usually referred to as a queen, one usually in each hive, worker bees, all female, who do all the work, and I mean all the work, in and out of the hive, other than lay the eggs, and drones, males, who eat and wait to mate. Drones make up about 10% of the hive, and worker bees make up about 90% of the hive. So each hive has three types, the female, the males, 10%, plus the mother of us all, who you call queen bee. She's not a queen. I think mother is a better term since she does not rule us. She is busy laying eggs all day, up to 2,000 eggs per day. That's really not the life of a queen. By the way, originally the queen was called a king, but after years of research and discovering the king had ovaries, the king became a queen. I think it's time, based on the evidence, to recognize she is more like a mother than a queen, particularly since she lays eggs all day long. And this is the picture, and you can see that these are all worker bees. Let me use this. And this is the queen bee, or mother of them all. And there she is. There's the queen laying the eggs, going around one after once here. There she is. I don't know if you can see her or not, but right there's the queen. She goes and she lays it. And this was pretty amazing because often when you take a hive, open a hive, she'll stop laying. Uh, but this, this queen was, this mother was busy. So what do worker bees do? Well, we do many things. First, we dig ourselves out of the cells where we develop into honeybees. We are housekeepers. We keep our mother and hive clean. We feed the younger bees, they nurture the bees. On the frames, we make waxy comb for storing honey, pollen, the eggs our mother lays on, on, the, on the frames. And there's a picture of a frame of sorts. We guard our hive's entrance from predators. We scout for plants and flowers in bloom, sources for pollen and nectar that we bring home to our hive. We even search for new homes. When we get too crowded, we swarm. This is the inside of a hive. And this is the comb they, wax comb they build. 
the worker bees do. And this is a picture of not only some female brood, but also some larvae in development in the hive. And this is the worker bees taking care of the brood in a hive. And this is drone brood. You'll see it's a little different. It protrudes from the comb itself. And you want a certain amount of drone brood, but it's in, important to, to not have it too much. And that is a picture of brood of the female brood, the worker bee brood. And again, they're caring for it. And this is a picture of some regular brood and some larva. And this is drone brood. And these are queen cells or mother cells. This is a hive where they're getting ready to make a new mother, which of course leads to what's called swarming, which is an indicator they are getting ready to swarm. Swarming. Another function orchestrated by the worker bees in nature's, is nature's way for honeybees to diversify and thrive as a species. Research suggests the process of swarming is more like a democracy than an autocracy. We make a new mother, we worker bees democratically decide which egg gets the special jelly that develops into another mother honey bee. We function more like a democracy than an autocracy. And when a new mother is ready to emerge from the specified created cell, half of us worker bees, a few drones, and our older mother leave the hive to find a new home. And in the process, we do what's called a waggle dance. Or in the way to finding a new structure, they communicate not only through chemical smells, but through the motioning called the waggle dance. And they waggle a particular way. There's this wonderful book about this whole process called Honeybee Democracy, where a guy named Thomas Seeley, who's been studying honeybee behavior for at least 50 years now, has done a whole book called Honeybee Democracy on the process of swarming, which highly suggests that the process is more like a democracy than, than a, a consensus model that they function as consensus. And it's, it's an incredible process. And I highly recommend that book if you're interested. Thomas Seeley, Honey Bee Democracy, a true consensus model. On their way to their new home, the honeybees often land on a variety of objects along the way. A fence, a light pole. I've had this particular light pole two years. I've had calls that there's a swarm and they weren't the same year with the following year, a recycle bin. And when you're lucky, a bush, but makes it easy to place the hive into a swarm box. This is us capturing a swarm in March earlier this year. So why do bees sting is a big question. Honey bees sting when they feel threatened or in jeopardy. And unlike some other bees like wasps, some other bees and wasps, bees and wasps are different species. Honeybees can only sting once, so they're less likely to sting because they're gonna die. Watch out when walking barefoot in clover or dandelions because there's a good chance there's some bees or honeybees down in there. If you wanna get stung, stand in front of the hive. If we come near you and you start buzzing, don't swat at us. That makes us fearful of you. Just slowly walk away. And there's a bee on clover, honey bee, probably in my yard. What about that honey? That's great. Thank you for making all that honey for us. Sorry, the honey we make is for us to survive, partly when there's a dearth. Explain the scarcity. If we have extra, we're glad to share it, but please leave us some. And these are the bees eating some honey that uh, was on top of one of the frames of a hive. There's all the worker bees. And this is a pulled, a frame of pulled comb that's covered. And so they cover it with wax so that in the winter have a food source. Honeybees do not hibernate. They, what they call cluster, and they cluster together and they keep the mother bee in the middle and they keep that, they have to keep that hive at a certain temperature. I hear bunny, honeybees are in danger. Yes, unfortunately, this is so. Over the past several decades, we honeybees and other bees and insects have decreased dramatically. 
there's been a significant quality loss. Although this seems to be changing, and a lot of people think it have has mainly to do with more beekeepers or bee stores. We used to live longer. Colony used to last for years without much care. Now we need help from bee stewards. Why are the bees so unhealthy? Well, the scientists, bird watchers, and bee stewards suggest lots of reasons and theories for our demise. And this is just a full circle, if you will, of a variety. This isn't in the book. This is just, I think, a good picture of the bigger picture of the systemic problems from habitat loss to parasites to diseases to pesticides. Uh, it's that nutrition. So parasites are a big problem. For example, the varroa destructor mite. They get on and they attack the nervous system and they can destroy a whole hive. Then you add the pesticides and the herbicides that people use for their yards or whatever, and that's problematic. And then if you combine these, the varroa mites or other mites and and the pesticides, you've really got a problem. Lack of diversity in flowers and plants. Monoculturing, another problem. Poor hive maintenance, like taking too much honey. If you took less for yourselves, we might starve. Not, we might not starve so often. A lot of mistake that some people do is take too much honey. And then in the winter, they feed them with sugar water, which some of us don't approve of very much. If I if my bees are gonna if the bees are gonna starve, they're not my bees. It's like when people say, Oh, you're a beekeeper, I say, Oh, I'm not a beekeeper. I don't keep bees, bees keep me. If they're starving or they don't have enough honey to make it through the winter because you've taken too much or they haven't been able to produce enough because of the dirt or the climate change or whatever, then I will feed. But our goal is and desire is to not have to feed the bees. In fact, right now we have six hives going into the winter and everyone of those six hives have a full box of honey frames, full box of eight or 10, depending on the size of the hive. And there's more in my freezer so that if we have to feed them some more, give it back rather than extract it. Okay, anything else? Feeling good, going strong into the winter. There we go. And of course, the bee stewards. If you're gonna be a bee steward, make sure you take a course, get a mentor right away and attend regular lectures or situations. Climate change. Climate change brings unpredictable weather. Unpredictable weather means unpredictable food sources. For example, on a warm day in the middle of winter, we may break our winter cluster and go out looking for flowers and freeze because we've broken the cluster and there's no flowers or nectar from the flowers to be had. Some the organism says, in its environment. That's what's important. The that organism. is what has to be protected, that relationship. Up until this point, Everything I have said so far, you will find in other books about honeybees, but you won't find the following page in any other bee book that I know of. And this is where cybernetics really comes into play for me in thinking and being with the bees. And that is, as many of you know, a fundamental, and some would say the fundamental of cybernetics is circularity. Of course, I have to mention that this circularity is what indigenous people have known all along uh, that we've gotten away from, but maybe cybernetics is a way to, or a logic for getting back there through another direction. So this, this page in the book is about circularity. It's about circularity, a fundamental of cybernetics and its companion, the circularity of needs, which generate the necessities for which these needs are met. A, a relationship that was first given to me by, or shared with me by a guy named Herbert Brune when exploring alternatives to peace as an achievement, but peace as a need, another story. So what can humans do to help? First, learn about us and nature in general. I don't, I don't know if I started the I guess you got it by now. If not, boy, did I make a mistake that the whole story is told by honeybee, a worker bee. So first we learn about us and they first learn about us and nature in general. Then learn the difference between what you want, what you need and what you desire. So in the book, we talk about the circular needs that generate the necessities for meeting those needs and make a distinction between what one needs, what one wants, what one desires, and what is necessary. Necessity, something that meets one's 
needs. I have to share a, a little story here because my, my co-conspirator on this project book said to me, do we have to put this page in? I'm like, yes, we do. And, and, and they were really useful in me being able to articulate clearly the whole book, but particularly this page. And then they went away and came back the next week and we went to work and they said, well, listen, I went to a flea market this weekend and all I kept thinking is, do I need or want that? Do I need or want that? I said, well, what did you buy? And they said, I didn't buy anything. And I was very happy. So what is necessary for the bees to survive? Great question. So then we introduced some ideas like this idea of no mow May. I'm sure some of you have heard about that, which is a movement about not mowing your lawns in May so that the clover and the dandelions, this is my backyard, which I no longer mow. But I, I, make a, I mow paths. I have these little gardens all through it. So people know I'm doing this on purpose. And we live right next to a public path. So plus being the bee steward in the neighborhood doesn't hurt so people know what I'm up to. This is the clover that we planted in our front yard. So I have a mix of grass and clover now, which means I mow a lot less. Clover is an incredible resource. It's drought resistant. It's inexpensive. It, it blooms. It, it requires no fertilizer. It doesn't need any herbicides. It grows in poor soils. Um, it rarely needs to be mowed. I, I mowed maybe five times the entire year. It's unaffected by pit urine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so clover is a really, really useful thing to add. And a lot of people on the hill here where I live, have, we've started adding clover and it really adds to the quality of the lawn. Don't use pesticides, insecticides, or herbicides. They're all poison to us and you. Visit an apiary, learn about all kinds of bees, plants, and pesticides. Join a club, become a bee city, USA. It's a big thing in, in, in the United States. Educate others, your peers, your parents, and teachers about the bees' needs and what's necessary to meet those needs. Thank you, honey bee. You're welcome. Remember, we're all in and on Earth together. Be well. And remember, language is never trivial. The end. <laughs> oh. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure.